2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. And we'll begin reading. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. So it's no longer an eye for an eye. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strong her, strongholds. Next scripture. Casting down imaginations. I heard a preacher say it this way the other day. It stuck with me. I'm not going out here. Casting down imaginations. The image of nations. Y'all see that with me? Casting down imaginations. Look into that word. Imaginations. The image of nations. Okay? Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. And bringing unto captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You may be seated. I want to say it was about Tuesday, Monday or Tuesday night, sat down to watch a video, preaching tape, CD, YouTube, whatever you call it, where was that? And, uh, I have one particular message that I do listen to that feeds my spirit, and you're welcome to chime into anything, look into anything that he has, and his name is Dr. Gerald Jeffers. And when he began to minister, a word came out of him and hit our spirits. And the word was, you've built a building, erected a house of the Lord, and when you did so, you declared war against your adversary. We were, we have been for a couple months now, fighting depression, oppression, uh, people going through every type of financial strain, job situation, all of these things. And our small group, that's pretty uncommon for every one of us to be dealing with some kind of family issue, depression issue. Yada, yada, yada. And so we know that we were at war. And probably knew, can't go back in my mind and know that when we were building this building, there were times where we'd come in here and pray first. And then we would work. There were times we walked in here and we prayed a prayer of repentance. Because we may have been joking or talking and may have gotten carried away. Maybe even talked about somebody, somebody we knew, family, whatever. And we felt the need one day, hey, we need to go in and repent for even even though we didn't have evil intent in our heart, we need to repent for that because everything we just said was absorbed by these walls. Everything we've done was absorbed by these walls. Our actions in this building, we had to be careful that we and and you know when you're working, frustrations come out when you're waiting on somebody to do this and they're waiting on you to do that. And this one's got that tool and you need that tool and Lord help me, I can't find the right tool. All those things mount frustration even when you're doing the work of the Lord. And so there were times we had to keep our spirits under check. There were times we got on each other's nerves and had to have a prayer meeting later just to love our brother when it was all done. All that happened right here in these walls. But we prayed over those things and realized that there was a war to take place. Literally two weeks before we opened the doors where the bias nearly lost the building itself to the bank. Reason was he let the insurance slip because he didn't want to have an insurance company come in here because we had it torn apart with wires hanging out the walls, plumbing exposed, floors open. And if an inspector had come, that would shut us down or made us get permits and bring somebody else in unless it goes to the combat. So, so we tried to keep them out of it. And so he let the insurance, it would have been better if he just kept it, but for some reason, whatever happened, it slipped. And he just let it stay off until we got ready to bring in and make it a church. And until we got to that point of opening. Well, in that time frame, he, he tried to settle up with the situation he had with the building as a rental property where he had to every year uh, have an inspection and an appraisal done as the way he had it set up, the mortgage he had set up. 
And uh, that time came, and the issue arose with the insurance. And they tried to tell him that he had defaulted on the mortgage and that uh, he had to get insurance on it. The insurance company was telling him, well, you defaulted the mortgage. And so everyone was telling him, you defaulted the mortgage. And for three days, now, he wouldn't tell me what was going on because he wanted to keep that off of me. But meanwhile, he didn't have to because we were already praying and feeling the attack. We could feel the pressure. Felt like something was happening. I was praying for Brother Bias' head because I knew he was going through something. And anyway, when it was all said and done, it came right down to, to him. He, he went back to him and said, look, they've got over $11,000 worth of work in that building. I've got over $40,000 invested in that building. We're trying to build a church out of it. Can't you help? And so he, he was not as frustrated about necessarily losing the building as he was the effort and work that we'd put in it. And it made him question what God had told him so long ago about this building, about me, about the church that was going to be here. All those things were rattled. And that's how the enemy works. Right before a threshold, right before a breakthrough, he will unleash everything he can come from, every angle that he can come from. Now, on the very day that it was supposed to go boom, the insurance company calls it. I think we could work with you. We found this route. We got this. So he calls the bank. They say, don't default me. I've got the insurance. Oh, we're good, Mr. Bice. Everything's going to be fine. we got it all lined up. Took him to the brink of going, okay, God, I've done all I can do. I, about, I feel like I've messed this whole thing up. I give it to you. And the next day, it was all cleared up. Like it was no big deal. He looked at me and said, I could have strangled both people I was talking to on the phone and the insurance and the mortgage company because they were telling me, oh, you're going to lose it all. And the next day, they're like, oh, it's no big deal. We got it. <laughs> so he said, I think I lost five years of my life this week <laughs> alone. And that's how this thing began. Okay? And I could go into other details about when we first come to the property to start working on it. There were a high, there were there were uh, carpenter bees that were all over the place. I mean, there was probably 150 of them. They were just swarming the place. And the Lord said that is a representation of the spirit of the area and is trying to intimidate you. And you don't need to move forward until you line yourself up with Brother Vice. Because Brother Vice was the owner of the property. See, God has all this stuff mapped out. He has an order laid out. He has a he has connections laid out. He knows exactly how it needs to be. He, he has a chain of command, if you will, or a set of rules, guidelines. And if we can just get into that, it'll take the worry off of us and the stress off of us, and we lean back on Him. There are pressures in opening a church building. Man, you ain't no good if you ain't got people getting the Holy Ghost and get baptized right away. What you doing out there? What you doing out there? Is God in There's still people looking at us right now wondering if we're going to make it in the next three or four months. All those pressures, the enemy hears those things and uses those as weapons and darts and targets. And here I am trying my best to marry two worlds, the world I believe God wants to, the direction God wants to take us in, and, and then our own understanding of where we have been and what traditional church is. So I've been trying to marry the two all this time, and the Lord tells me this week, you're at war. Be you. Okay. Anybody ever tell you you can just be yourself and cause you to kind of relax a little bit? I be myself. I ain't got to impress the balls. I ain't got to worry about what I say. It, it helps you relax. Right? So the Lord said, be what I called you to be. So today I'm being what He called me to be. And not that I haven't, you know, you know what I mean. So, the direction we're going in is different. But, but good Lord, that felt good, didn't it? That felt good. Didn't it? And we didn't have to sing it up. We didn't have to <laughs> drum it up. We didn't have to sweat over it. We just come in here. We pray hard. We reach for him. And he showed up. He touched every one of us. Now, we are at war. Read the headlines. Read the news. We are in a spiritual war. Not just for our country, for our houses, for the church, for our family. We have been in but the war just went up a notch. The war just took a tip, it would seem like. Really, it would occur.
encouraged us. Don't need to be frustrated or aggravated about it. Oh, that's just one more. He said it's going to get worse and worse. Not better. And God bless everybody who wants better. He didn't say it was getting better. It's getting worse. Now, while it's getting worse, it shouldn't affect me. Because I got this going on. I'm at peace with Him. I'm in His plan. I'm covered. I'm protected. Whatever happens, He let happen. And I need to relax in that. I've got to learn to relax in that. So in the Scripture, it says, we, won't, we, we walk in the flesh, but we don't war after the flesh. I don't have a war chest at home with Uzis laying up in it. I haven't stockpiled grenades or handguns. I don't have machetes in there or spears or knives. Because this is not a flesh war. Okay? For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty. They're not carnal. They're not physical, but they are mighty. How many times do you remember reading or hearing about in your Old Testament where Israel is outnumbered? Gideon, for example, started out with 7,000, 3,000 men, taken to the brook, let them drink, one test after another until he was left with 300 men. Wait a minute, Lord, we're going the wrong way. There were three or 7,000, you go back and review it, but they were that many strong, but the enemy was like grasshoppers. They looked over the hills and on top of it, they had their scouts and they were up on the mountains and they were looking out and man, they were a million army men out there ready to wipe them out. And they only had, he went to prayer because he only had a few, 3,000 and before it was done, the Lord said, you got two men? What? <laughs> really? And so when it was all said and done, he has 300 men and guess what? They didn't go pick up swords. They didn't pick up knives or, or, or spears or bows and arrows. No, they went and grabbed a pitcher and a lantern. Yeah. Knock a, I knock a few over the head for it bust out and it ain't no good in my hand no more. No. Now you're going to go up on the top of the mountain. It's been a while since I read the story, so y'all might help me. But they went on top of the mountain. And he said, when I say, you give the signal, you give the horn, there's a horn involved, you give the horn and you smash the pitcher. So they obey the Lord, the signal was given, they blow the trumpet, they smash it, and the enemy began to turn on itself. And they never set foot on the battlefield. And they destroyed themselves, and what was left, they turned and ran. And there are accounts that there are angels slaying them. Now, he said, the battle is not yours, but it's mine. It's not yours, it's mine. That's what he's told us. If we would ever believe that, a lot of stress would come off our backs. A lot of worry would come off our chest and off our minds and let him fight. That's why it says, mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. There are spirits and strongholds that are causing people to do the things that they do. Guiding them to do the things that they do. So, you know, the guy that's tormenting you, the guy that's persecuting you, he's not the problem. It's the Spirit influencing him to come against you that's the problem. That's why he tells us, love your enemy. That's why he tells us, do good to those who persecute you. Why? Because they're not the problem. It's the spirit that wants to come to you and destroy you. That is the problem. Now, verse 5 says, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. Imaginations. Our country has constantly, and we've talked about this, thwarted our mind with images through television, through movie screen, whatever, laptops, billboards. We are being plummeted with images that they say we need to be like. They say we need to pursue. Happiness is this. Uh, you know, the American dream is 
white picket fence and a white house on five acres of land with lots of land and fruit and veggies and self-made man and you've retired and you're just chilling. That's the image they say, our nation says, is the American dream. I don't have that. But I'm content in what I have. Because I have more than that. I have the Spirit of the Lord dwelling in me. I have a relationship with the Lord. And what is mine is His. And I'm promised greater things than this stuff I'm going to leave behind when I go. So if I'm working and striving for that image that that nation gave me, it's got me distracted. It's creating worries and stresses that God never intended me to have. I know what that was. And so I'm, I'm warring against those imaginations. He said, in every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. The knowledge of God. The Word of God. The knowledge of God. What happened with the Supreme Court decision? It exalted itself against the knowledge of God. It said, we know better than you do, God. We decided that this is okay, regardless of what you say. Now, that would normally not be the case if, if the United States wasn't under God in the beginning. Although it probably never was. <laughs> but it made the statement, and men and women that here that fought and died believe in the Lord, we brought that to our nation. But the fact that it, for years now, the United States has represented Christianity. It has represented God to other nations. It has represented a better lifestyle because we honored, respected, and obeyed the things the Lord gave us and we were able to live that in this nation until now. So for a long time, the government actually followed the laws of God until we decided we want to remove them off the courthouse walls, you can't pray in the classroom, and one by one by one, they tear down the knowledge of God and they lift another image up. And so we have to cast down those, nations, those images that the nations have put upon us. Those things, every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. That high thing, the scripture in Ephesians says this. Finally, give me uh, Ephesians chapter 6 and the King James Version. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole arm of God that you may be able to withstand the wiles of the devil. Next verse. Man, I had that one yet. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. High places. What does that mean? Anybody know what a high place is? Do you really know what that means? Sometimes we just read stuff up uh, and we keep reading. We don't really dig into what it means. High place. A mountain. Okay, in the Old Testament, the prophets and the kings would go up to the mountains and they would overlook the valley and look into the... Because a high place gave them a higher position to be able to look down upon everything. It raised their viewpoint. Okay? And so this high place was often where they sacrificed to other gods and other idols. You read the Old Testament about them having high places and groves in the high places. These groves were places where they set up altars and they were having ungodly uh, affections one toward another and doing it unto idols and witchcraft and these types of things. And these were the things that God kept telling the kings to go and tear down. Tear down the groves in the high place. Tear down the uh, uh, the things that they, these idols they put in the groves and in the high places and set me up an altar there and set up an incense for me. Because it is in the high places, even today, the Spirit of the Lord and other spirits will seek after high places. You can go to certain mountains, if you will, because it is a high place, and you can begin to worship the Lord there, and you can actually feel Him a little faster there than other places. He honors the high place. He established that. Now, look to your body. Where's your high place? Why is it that your mind is at the top of your body and not on the 
sole of your foot. Because this is your high place. This is the high place. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. High places are your government seats. The government seat is the high place of our nation. The capital, the White House, is the high place of the government covering the nation. Not necessarily physically high, but in authority over the nation it is the high place. Your state capitals are the high place of your state. The uh, Washington, D.C. is the high place of the nation. So there is spiritual wickedness in high places. High places of government. High places of mindsets. Okay? So this is the war that we're in. Now, going back to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 5. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. This is all about the mind. Imaginations, knowledge, thought. Imaginations, knowledge, thought. Where does all that take place? Right here. Your warfare is right here. How I perceive things is right here. When the enemy comes in, that's why we get called up. We take things as they appear to be instead of listening to what the Spirit of the Lord says they are. He's given us promises. But instead, we can't see the promise because we're staring at the trouble. That's right. The trouble distracts us from the promise. Peter climbs out of the boat. He's about to walk. He's about to do something. Now, before he ever looked at the storm and he saw Jesus out there, he, dude, Jesus is walking on the water. Not that he probably said dude, but man, whatever. Jesus is walking on the water. Didn't need to come. I'm going to do it. Can I do it? Come on, Peter. <laughs> we don't know if he took one step, two steps, but he took more than anybody else in the boat. But as long as his high place was locked in on the high priest, he walked on the water. However long. Step, two step. But as soon as he got his mind off of him and over on the storm, that stuff was already there. But for a brief moment, he got his mind on the Lord and he took a walk on water. And then that moment passed and he's back on that and he's drowning. And the Lord reached down for so you can, you can look at that at either angle. You can say, man, he had his mind on the Lord and walked on the water, and then he got his mind off the Lord and sank. Or you can say, he had his mind on all the trouble, and when he finally got into the Lord, the miraculous happened, but as soon as he got off the Lord, he fell in the water. However you want to look at it. That's where we are. That's us. Fleeting moments. We can get our faith and our spirit all lined up in a moment and do incredible things in all of us. Mm -hmm. That's what we want to try to maintain. That's where our focus has got to be. And that's why He attacks us in the high places. That's why He attacks us in our minds. That's why He hits us in the textbooks. That's why He's all over the internet. That He is keeping our minds so embattled with information to downplay the gospel. To down, we would have a good conversation about heaven and hell the, the other night, Penny and James. Hell, they got they got uh, videos and shows about hell boy. I haven't watched it. I can only imagine what the content is. Probably that he's a good guy who came out of hell and he's a hero. I don't know. That's pretty stupid. But hey, if I've said it out there and I've I showed it up, everybody would think hell ain't so bad. They got heroes in there. Maybe I can work in the air conditioning in hell. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, so eventually hell, not such a bad place. You've heard preachers, there are some preachers got lost in false doctrine saying that we're living in hell now. That this is hell. Because of the torture and the chaotic places and like Ethiopians and the things they're going through and the things that Christians are suffering in other places, they're going through hell right now. That is nothing. That is a moment. That is a lifetime. It is not an eternity of being separated from God and being tormented by all the opportunities you had to reach them. 
All the opportunity, all the times he reached to you and you shunned him. You will be tormented because you just didn't reach that one time. I let that go by. Oh, oh, oh. And then that is weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you think about gnashing of teeth, when people are stressed to the max, they bite their, mm, they, they get TMJ, they get, they go to sleep and they're, they're grinding their teeth. That is the gnashing of the teeth because the stress level will be so great. Constantly be grinding those teeth, gnashing at the teeth. That is hell and that is real, but our world don't want to portray it that way. They're trying to set up false images. The complete Jewish Bible reads this way. For although we do live in the world, we do not wage war in a worldly way. Because the weapons we use to wage war are not worldly. On the contrary, they have God's power for demolishing strongholds. We demolish arguments. And every arrogance that raises itself up against the knowledge of God, we take every thought captive and make it obey the Messiah. I need to take my thoughts captive and make it line up to the Word of God. Now, I can't do that if I don't know the Word of God. Mm -hmm. Right? So, it behooves me to learn the Word of God. It behooves me to read the Word of God. Now, we've gone through Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, let's go back there. And I want to read that in the complete Jewish Bible, verse 10 through, 7, through 18. Finally, grow powerful in union with the Lord, in union with His mighty strength. Use all the armor and weaponry that God provides, so that you will be able to stand against the deceptive tactics of the adversary. For we are not struggling against human beings, but against the rulers, authorities, and cosmic powers governing this darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. So take up every piece of war equipment God provides so that when the evil day comes, you will be able to resist and when the battle is won, you will still be standing. Therefore, stand, having the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Put on righteousness for our breastplate. And wear on your feet the readiness that comes from the good news of peace. Always carrying the shield of trust with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And take the helmet of deliverance along with the sword given by the Spirit that is the Word of God. As you pray at all times with all kinds of prayers and requests in the Spirit vigilantly and persistently for all God's people. Well, I like to complete Jewish Bible a little better sometimes. It gets you right in there. Now, Amplified, I'm going to read 13 through 17. This brings other viewpoints. Therefore, put on God's complete armor, that you may be able to resist and stand your ground on the evil day of danger, and having done all the crisis demands, to stand firmly in your place, stand therefore, hold your ground, having tightened the belt of truth around your loins, and having put on the breastplate of integrity. Breastplate of integrity and of moral rectitude and right standing with God. And having you shod your feet in preparation to face the enemy with the firm foot of stability, the promptness and the readiness produced by the good news of the gospel of peace. Lift up over all the covering shield of saving faith upon which you can quench all the flaming missiles of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword that the Spirit, will, the sword that the Spirit wields, which is the Word of God. This is your sword. This is it. Now, we can't carry this everywhere we go, but we can take it and put it in there and it'll be wherever we go. I'm going to move on to 1 Timothy chapter 17, chapter 1, verse 17 through 19. 
Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Verse 18. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. We are in a war. 19. Holding faith and a good conscience, which come, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. They've shipwrecked their conscience because they didn't hold their ground. Now, the complete Jewish Bible says it this way, verse 18, This charge, son Timothy, I put to you, in keeping with the prophecies already made about you, so that by these prophecies you may fight the good fight, armed with trust and a good conscience. By rejecting conscience, some have made shipwreck of their faith. What's that talking about? What is your conscience? Again, it's your mind. It is the Spirit of God. It is you knowing whether or not I'm doing what God said to do or not. It is your, your conscience is the one that tells you you don't need to be up in the bar joint. It's the one telling him, ah, you probably want to change the channel. It's about to happen. She's going to come out the shower. Turn it off. Watch that commercial. It's Victoria's Secret. Huh? A good conscience. Your mind. That's the, the Holy Ghost becomes that conscience. Hey, get away from here. Hey, don't touch that. Look out. It's not a set of rules to belittle you and box you in. No, it's protecting you. It's keeping you. So the weapons that are mentioned there were trust or faith and a clear conscience. So those are weapons. He's a fighting good fight. These are your weapons. Faith and a good conscience. There's two weapons. Faith and a good conscience. How do I keep my faith up? Faith cometh by hearing. Hearing by the Word of God. You hear the preaching of the Word. You read the Word out loud. You increase your faith. You build up your most holy faith praying in the Holy Ghost. Why? Because Jesus is the Holy Ghost and He is the Word of God made flesh. So if the Word of God was made flesh and it was Jesus walking the earth and Jesus said, if you, if you want the Comforter, call my name. He's going to come running because He is the Comforter. So when you receive the Holy Ghost, you don't just receive the Spirit of God. You receive the Word of God. So if I have the Holy Ghost in me, I have the Word in me. That's why He said the Comforter will remind you of everything that I said. The Holy Ghost will remind you of my word. There are times, I, I've read this Bible probably four or five times from front to cover in my lifetime. I've taught Bible studies from one end to the other probably three or four times. So this is in here somewhere. But me, I don't have a photographic memory. Okay? The more I preach and teach, the more familiar I stay with what I'm preaching and teaching so I can quote a scripture here and there. But I can't Reach back and tell you what Genesis 23 and 8 says. No clue. The Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. I, it, he might not tell me Genesis 23 and 8, but he'll tell me what he said. Mm -hmm. There are times the Spirit will speak to you a word in your head, and you'll be like, where is that at? I know that scripture, but where is it at? What is that? He's reminding you of what he said. Amen. Now, he might not tell you it's Genesis 24 and 8. But he may tell you, he will give you that word. He will remind you of that word. So how in the world can he remind me of that if I haven't put it in there? If I haven't heard it, if I haven't read it, if I haven't said it. I'm going to try to move this thing toward a close. We're probably going to be on this for a while. Okay. Let me talk about the war chest, okay? Real quick. This is what the Spirit spoke to me earlier this week and, and where all this is coming from. This all happened before. The Lord gave it this before what happened Thursday or Friday happened. He knows. He knows what's coming. 
A war chest. <clears throat> a war chest. And again, I, I, I looked at this after the Spirit said this to me. What the Spirit said to me is, you're in a war. What do you need to fight the war? And I thought, man, I need a word. I need praise. I reached it to my own knowledge. I need these things. And then the Spirit of the Lord said, you need a good war chest. Like, I know I've heard that term before. I know what that means. So I look it up. A war chest is a metaphor for any collection of tools or money intended to be used in a challenging or dangerous situation. Historically, it referred to the chest located in the homes or barracks of soldiers, in which the soldier kept arms and armor. And in the modern era, it more often refers to a collection of funds or less occasionally special tools or equipment intended to allow a person or organization to get through a situation that requires much more readiness or money than usual. That's a war chest. Let me give you the word history, the etymology of the word war chest. In arms and armor, a war chest is a container for the personal weapons and protective gear of a citizen soldier, kept in the household and is the, and is the origin of the term. The term's modern meaning originates with the medieval practice of having a chest literally filled with the money to open in a time of war. So kings would have a, what they called a war chest in a particular place that was full of gold. And when time of war come, they'd pull out those chests and they would spend that money on weaponry and spend that money on horses and spend that money on uh, buying men, buying food and going to battle. So that war chest was full and ready. You got the war chest ready in a time of peace so that when the war came, you were ready. And so... There are contents that we need to have in our war chest. And our war chest is right here. This is your war chest. Now, what do I need to put in there? And over the next course of the next weeks, I'm going to talk to you about eight things to put in your war chest. In order to be prepared for a war that you're not expecting, or you don't know when it's coming, but you're expecting it. You gotta have a war chest, and it must have the necessary contents to sustain sustain you during the war, and it has to have the contents to war a good warfare that will lead you to many victories. If you ain't got nothing in your war chest, and the war hits, and you're unprepared, and you have nothing to reach back to, it kind of spells imminent defeat. I got nothing to fall on. I got nothing to reach for. I got nothing to use. I'm going to get my behind kicked in this war. So I'm going to talk to you about eight things. Starting with the armor of God. These eight things are these. I'm just going to list them. I'm not going to go into them today. We'll do that next week. But the armor of God needs to be in your war chest. We read earlier what those things were. The pieces of the armor of God are number one, the belt of truth. Right? John 1.17 says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. John 4.23 says, But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. Now, I, in my head I was like, Well, Lord, the sword of the Spirit is truth. Yes, it is, but this is a different truth. The word in the Greek is alethes, which is to be true, not concealing anything, speaking truth. What is this truth? It means coming naked before God, not concealing your heart, not concealing your agenda, coming naked, being open, not hiding anything. So, belt of truth. Number two, breastplate of righteousness, integrity, and morality. Number three, feet sandaled and strapped, ready with a firm foot of stability provided by the gospel. So number three is feet sandaled and strapped. Number four, shield of faith, 
and trust. Number five, I'm going too fast, just yell at me. Helmet of salvation or deliverance. And number six, the sword of the Spirit, Word of God. Number seven, songs of praise. And number eight, testimonies. Got to have a good testimony in your war chest. He said they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by their testimony. So we're going to talk about over the next course of the next few weeks these eight things in your war chest. Now, this is the part the Bible says iron sharpeneth iron. Right? What does that mean? I will bring a mic and stick it out there. <laughs> Don't do it. Look. She just gave you a look like a cool here. <laughs> Say, hey man, I know I'm out here, 
but I can't do that without you. And so we've got to have each other. One sharpens the other. Now, we have to help each other. That's why it says forbear one another, love one another, because I'm going to be weak sometimes. Where my faith might get weak, yours might, you might be hitting a high. So I'm going to take my weak faith and kind of lean over on yours for a little while. You're going to pump me back up. Hopefully mine don't pull you down. <laughs> right? So we're going to help each other. Uh, some have to give to see things. Some have to give to uh, discern things. Some have to give to uh, word of knowledge, healing. Hey man, the miracle gifts are like awesome. Some guy gets the people walk up, be lazy, and lay their hands on, poof, they're healed. The rest are like, Jesus, please heal it. Time, time, please touch, heal. And we go to like service after service, parents might get healed, and eventually they get healed, but that guy just said, be healed. Come on. Hey. Look at that. But that, 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 that's how it works. So I don't get, I don't need to get upset because I work hard to get help that person get healed, and he just said, Poof, she got healed. I don't get upset about that. I'm thankful for that. Next time I need somebody to get healed, I'm calling on that gift. Hey, come here, man. I ain't going to spend hours on this. You get over here and take care of you. Yeah. Right? So if I'm coming into a service and, and I can sing a little, but man, I want some good music, I'm going to lean on them and say, hey, y'all put me something together. Because if I do, we'll get through it, but it won't be nearly as good. Okay? So here's the other piece of that. You've got people you're going to be witnessing to and loving on and trying to bring into the kingdom. You're going to get them to a point. And you might get stuck. And how, how, do, I get them, how do I get them to want to get baptized? How do I get them to get holy with them? Hey, bro. i got a Bible study on. And uh, I reached a point where I'm stuck. Can you help? Shoo choo, baby. I'll be able to lay hands on them in a second. So that's how we help each other. Now, I don't mean we ain't going to frustrate each other and aggravate each other just like brothers and sisters do. Somebody asked a question to me and my brother while we were sitting at the table. It was um, Marissa, I think, asked my brother. He said, she said, Uncle Cliff, how often did you and Uncle Jeff fight? <laughs> He said, you ain't got enough fingers and toes. <laughs> we grew up in the same house, shared the same bedroom for 17 years. I was a clean freak. He was a messy dude. And that clashed every morning getting ready for school. He was not a morning person. I was more of a morning person. We, clashed, we fought every morning for 17 years. Sometimes it wound up in little fisticuffs, and sometimes it was over in one swing, and sometimes we just ignored each other. But we fought almost every day. But you let somebody else mm -hmm. touch my brother. Then it's on my donkey Kong. <laughs> I can beat him up, but don't you touch him. <laughs> I, I, I'll set him straight, but you don't touch him, because you touch him, you touch me. That's the way we need to be about each other. Hey, when the enemy is attacking one of y'all, I go to war. Leave them alone. I get mad. You need to learn to get mad. Hey, he said be angry and sin not. He didn't say don't be angry. He gave you that. He gets angry. You're going to get angry. What do you do in the anger? You turn it where it belongs. You kick his behind with it. Not your brother. The spirit. So we got to get each other's back. That's what iron sharpening iron means. And in war, you are sometimes only as good as your partner. Kings had armor bearers. While they were fighting, there was a guy. All he did, he had a little bitty, he had a little bitty blade, and he had his big old armor that he had to hold up, and he was covering his back. So he had they were they would hook arm one arm like that. King was singing, swinging that sword, or that soldier was singing, swinging that sword. The other guy was blocking people from coming from the rear and stabbing people and fighting that little thing. But his main job was to keep him protected from the backside. That's what we do for each other. That's what we do for each other. So you ain't got it all together. I ain't got it all together. But bless God, together we'll get something accomplished. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together.
today's been different, but I can't have fun today. Yeah. <laughs> and you feel like you feel like we got somewhere today, man. Yeah? Yeah. All right. Uh, today at two o'clock there is a.